Jesus for Children's Church. Good morning. How are you? Hey, it's good to see you. Welcome, 9 o'clock crowd. Glad you made it out today. Hope you'll say the same thing when we're finished. I uh, look forward to getting back to our series on Ephesians called Christianity 102. Uh, it's a simple introduction. I, I believe this is a little more challenging book of the New Testament. Romans, a great book of the Bible. I consider 101. What is the gospel? Why do we need the gospel? What's it do in our lives? Uh, I think we should start there. But Ephesians, Ephesians goes deeper. It goes further. And it really explains how we are to live now that we're in Christ. And that's the part we are in the study. If you're new to us, the first three books of Ephesians are all theory. That talks about what it means to be in Christ. And now from 4, 5, and 6, we're going to learn what that looks like to live a life worthy of our calling. So that's where we are. Uh, as I shared with you last week, uh, the Navy made certain my education did not stop after West Virginia Tech. Um, four days after leaving tech, or graduating tech, I went straight to the military uh, four months of officer training, as I talked last week, six months of nuclear physics and chemistry theory, six months of nuclear physics and chemistry practice, uh, another four or five months at submarine warfare school. So put that all together with the time in between for travel. That was two more years that I went with education. So you add that to the four years of college, that's six years. You add that to the 12 years of, of school and public schooling. That was like, wow. 18 years of school straight I was I was finished I'd had enough it was time to go to work so I got to go to my first real job and that was on the USS Bluefish SSN 675 a nuclear submarine out of Charleston South Carolina uh, exciting job really neat job uh, other than driving a submarine you have to do a, a work you have to have a job and so my job <laughs> was unique all the officers had to basically be engineers all of us were engineers and so we had all four uh, of the main engineering groups covered. We had nuclear engineering, we had uh, mechanical engineering, we had electrical engineering, we had chemical engineering, just no civil. And so we all had one of those positions. Guess which one I got? Chemical, right? We've talked about this. I hated chemistry. It's the only C I ever made in my life. It was the worst class I ever had in college. I hated chemistry. And what was my job for three years? I was the chemical expert on a submarine. I was responsible for all the nuclear reactor chemistry. I was responsible for the engine plant chemistry. I was the chemist for three years. I never want to do that again. That's just awful. I hate chemistry. But that was my job. And so I was responsible for all that. I was responsible for the enlisted folks uh, in the field. Their, their situation was a little different. The officers had to be able to do every job. That, that was our requirement. Uh, but the enlisted guys, when they came through their training, Obviously, it was flagged if they were better in one area or another. And so I had the guys who had gotten flagged for chemists. So I had basically the chemists working for me. Uh, the nuclear reactor guy had the people who understood reactor theory well. The electrician or electrical engineer had the electricians. Uh, the mechanical engineer had the mechanics, which is what I wanted. Didn't happen. And so we all had our areas of expertise and those people that worked for us. And our job as engineers was to work together to make sure... Uh, the engine plant ran successfully so that the captain could fight the boat. That was our job. Make sure he had the ability to, to fight the boat. And so that meant everybody had to do their job. Otherwise, it could be catastrophic. I thought about that when I read this passage and prepared this sermon because that's really what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the church in light of what I just explained. God has given the engineers. God has given the staff their abilities to do the things they do. And God has equipped everybody in the church to do a specific function. And so it's our job to make sure everybody's working so that the, we can fight the ship, so that the church can be successful. And that's where we're going today. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, the letter Paul wrote to the church, chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And stand with me, please. If you don't have a Bible, I read from the NLT, which is right underneath your seat in those blue paperbacks. Uh, really easy to follow through. It's page 705 in those Bibles. So we are in Ephesians chapter 4, going to read 7 through 16, and this is really a part B to what I started last week. And you'll notice immediately at verse 7, he says, however, so this is connected to the previous conversation. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. He clear, this clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended 
higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these gifts, or these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Okay, this is specific. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of this body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Let's pray. Father, that is our desire. We want this church to be healthy and, and growing and full of love. And today you give us the instruction on how that is to happen. So I thank you for everyone who made the effort to get up this morning, to get out of the house and get down to your house, so that we can make this happen through your spirit. So thank you for that in advance. God, I thank you for all those who made it out today with They've got issues going on in their lives. Uh, they've got concerns, whether their relationship or health or family. Father, there's so many things going on, and, and yet they came here this morning expecting to meet with you and find the help that they needed. And so, Father, I, I pray that is the end this morning, and, and I thank you for that in advance. Uh, Father, we want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, and that's all a part of this molding process. Now, Father, those who don't know you, thanks for bringing them to church. Um, I'm not sure what their hesitation is. I'm not sure what's going on in their lives. But I just pray that today the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is so powerful and compelling on their lives that by the end of this service they'll be ready to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so, Father, that is the end I pray to. So I ask that you remove me from your word and speak through it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, again, we know who wrote this letter. It was the Apostle Paul. Paul used to be Saul, the Pharisee. He was a, a spiritual leader of the Jews who hated Jesus, who hated the church, persecuted the church, had Christians thrown into prison, and even killed. And yet God redeemed him. God changed him. Did a 180 in his life on the road to Damascus. Even changed his name from Saul to Paul and gave him the commission to go to the Gentiles, to us, to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he was a church planner. That's what we would call him today. Uh, he traveled the known world, which is the area of Turkey today. And it was in an area called Ephesus that he planted one of his churches. That was in the 50s A.D. So he plants this church. He establishes it with the, the believers, the new Christians. Um, he gets leadership set up. He finds the gifted people and, and gets that established. And once he thinks it's self-sufficient, he moves on to the next town. So he's done that in a few cities, but then he got into some trouble. And he wound up in prison because of his trouble. And so now sitting in prison, he's thinking about these churches that he's planted and he's sending back letters to encourage them. And that's what we just read, part of a letter that Paul sent back to the Ephesians to encourage them. And what he's encouraging them to do is something very straightforward. It's the line that we started with last week that we need to start with every week. This is what he's encouraging Christians to do. Lead a life worthy of your calling. Okay? Lead a life worthy of your calling. He knew these Ephesians had experienced Jesus Christ just as it's preserved for us today. They knew what it meant to be in Christ. They knew what it took to be in Christ. They knew they were in the family of God. They knew they were in the, the house of God, the church. They knew they were citizens of heaven. They knew all these things. They had this knowledge. And now he says, hey, guess what? That is a high calling. A very high calling. It's the highest calling, as a matter of fact, on earth. And so since you've been called to this high calling, you should live a life that's worthy of it. Axios, remember that word? Axiom. You should balance it. Your behavior, your lifestyle should balance this calling that you've received. And so we should all live a life that's worthy of your calling. And that's what we're doing through chapters 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so we started that last week. Now we carry it further. Let's begin with the discussion about the central idea of gifting. That is the big idea this morning, is the idea of gifting. First, he says believers, true followers of Jesus Christ, are gifted. 
Now, if you look back in verses 4 through 6, Paul focused on the ones. One spirit, one Lord, one Father. Uh, it was over all through all and in all. Um, he is talking about the church as a unified body. Now he transitions from all of us to each of us. Each of us has something special that we've been given. Um, I think uh, John Stott stated in his commentary the best. He says, the unity of the church, which we've been focusing on, is due to charis, or charis, God's grace. But the diversity of the church is due to charisma, okay? God's gifts distributed to the church member. Now, I know that's a tough word today. A lot of people, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard when you say charismatic. Especially, you're like, I'm not charismatic, I'm a Baptist, right? I'm not charismatic. Well, if you are a Baptist and you're not charismatic, you're an unsaved Baptist. All right? That's just a fact. If you're a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever you are, if you're not charismatic, you're unsaved. Well, what we just read. Because the scriptures say very clearly that every Christian is gifted. Okay? Every Christian is gifted. That's what charisma actually means. Charismatic is not a term that we can accurately apply to any one specific church. It applies to the entire church. All of us should be charismatic. Every true believer has been given charisma. Um, Paul goes on to great lengths to explain what it took for us to get these gifts. We got the ascended, descended thing. And most scholars and theologians believe, and I agree, that they're talking about Jesus leaving heaven. Jesus descended from heaven. He willfully came to this earth, willfully put on flesh this lowly world so that we could be related to God. He willfully came so that he could take the abuse, so that he could take the pain, so that he could take the death that was required for our sins, right? He descended for that reason, and then he was resurrected, raised from the dead, walked on this earth with his followers, and 40 days later he ascended into the heights of heaven. He did all of that what? And gave us gifts. All right, so that's the explanation of who gave us gifts, how he gave us gifts. We are all gifted. Every Christian is gifted. Now, We've got to talk about this. Since we're all gifted, we need to understand a little bit about it. There is a variety of gifts. There's a variety of gifts. Uh, Paul's purpose in this passage is to focus specifically on the gifts given to the church. Um, so I'm not going to go into great details on the actual gifts of all believers. There's at least five lists that I came up with of different gifts. And there's over 20 specific gifts given in those passages and so, again, Paul didn't explain all of them, and I won't either. Suffice it to say, there is no exhaustive gift of list, or list of gifts. Let me get it right. Every Christian is gifted in some way. You might be good, again, gifted at playing the guitar or the piano. You may be gifted, as we're going to talk about, speaking or teaching. You may be gifted at cutting grass. You're better than others at that. I don't know what it is, but you have a gift if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's your job to figure out what that is. And it's your job to use it in the church. That's the next step. The gifts are to be used to support the church. Okay? Remember, we're all called as citizens of one country. Members of one family. Members of one body. The church. And so if Christ has given us gifts, do you think he wants them to use this anywhere else? Why would he give us, give us gifts that way? Think about it. He has gifted us to use them in the church. Unfortunately, um, there are a lot of Christians that think their gifts are to be used outside the church and not inside the church. They sit in church, they don't make contributions in church, and it makes no sense at all. Paul says very clearly, we're given gifts to help each other. If you want that reference, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Peter ch echoes the same sentiment in 1 Peter 4, 10. He says, use these gifts well to serve one another, Christians. So, we've been gifted. We're supposed to use this variety of gifts in the local church. I thought of a couple of examples. We are blessed in this church to have a lot of coaches and teachers. This is the coach church, or it always has been since I've been here. Um, and many of our folks are using the gifts of leadership and teaching. Those are two gifts that come with coaching and teaching uh, in the community, and we're thankful for that. The question is, are they using them in the church? Okay. Then there's the gift of generosity. We've been blessed. A lot of folks have been blessed financially in our church community. Many appreciate the fact that we support those other efforts, the, the non-biblical efforts. Uh, again, cancer research, ALS research, that's all phenomenal stuff to do, but is that gift of generosity being used in the church as well? See what I'm saying? It's one thing to have a gift, it's another thing to use it right and use it correctly. Use it in the church. That's what it's designed for. Now, 
Let me uh, move on to Paul's main reason for bringing up the gifts. Let's talk about the church being gifted. Okay? The church is gifted, and I like the way this goes. After speaking in general about the gifts given to individual Christians, Paul gets specific. Verse 11, he focuses on the specific gifts given to the church. Um, he gives a list, so we need to talk about them individually. So let's walk through this. It's actually in two parts, and I'll explain. You've got the apostles and the prophets, and then you've got the evangelists, teachers, and preachers. We'll get to that. Okay, so let's start with the apostles. Um, this is a Baptist church, so this discussion shouldn't shock most of us here. But some of you may be from different backgrounds, so I need to be very specific. Paul said earlier in Ephesians 2.20 that the foundations of the church were built upon the apostles and the prophets. Okay? The apostles and the prophets. Um, and those were the 12 apostles, plus Paul, and many include James, the brother of Jesus. So maybe 14. 14 specific people that started the church. It was a finite group of people who were called face-to-face -face by Jesus Christ and given gifts by Jesus Christ, and they died in the first century. There are no more apostles. There were only those apostles. It was a finite group of people who helped start the church. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, uh, he says that they were the first, or given first, were the apostles. Okay, So we do not have apostles today. But they were the gifts given to the church in the first century that laid the foundations. Along with the apostles, there were prophets. Okay? There were New Testament prophets. This shouldn't be a shocker to you. There are no prophets today. Okay? There are no prophets today. Along with the apostles, the New Testament prophets were used for, for, by God to help establish that first church. Um, and we get that again in Ephesians 2.20. Now, we get the author of Hebrews telling us there's been a transition. The author of Hebrews tells us in 1.1 that God used to speak through the prophets in the old times. Now he speaks through whom? Jesus Christ. He speaks through the Son. How does he speak to the church through the Son? He speaks through the Spirit. The Spirit's stirring the heart. That's one of his jobs. He speaks through the Word, right? Jesus is the Word. We have the Word. He speaks through the Word. And he speaks through us, the teachers and the preachers and the evangelists. So let's go there. Okay, let's talk about evangelists. Um, this begins the second grouping, which is the continuous gifting of the church. The first two were in the first century. The rest remain until the church is finished. So the first one is the evangelist. Now, we have to remember um, that we're all witnesses. Every Christian is called to be a witness. And our witness is to live a life that's worthy of the calling we've received. That's what it means. It means living in a way that people see that we're different. We live a godly life so people understand what it looks like to be a Christian. And when they ask, as we know the Bible says, why we're different, when they ask why we have hope, when they ask why this happened in our life, we're supposed to be ready to tell them, right? That's our testimony. That's what it means to be a witness. It's like being called into court. What have you seen? What have you heard? What is the truth? And so every Christian is supposed to be this witness to give our testimonies. But we're not all gifted evangelists. That's just a fact. Even all pastors are not gifted evangelists. We're going to talk about pastors and teachers in a minute. We all have the job to do the work of evangelism, right? To share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean we're all gifted evangelists. We do have gifted evangelists in this world. The one who came to mind is my favorite, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a gifted evangelist. You cannot deny his gifting. Billy Graham was not a pastor. <laughs> he was a teacher. There's no question he was a gifted teacher. But Billy Graham's calling was to be an evangelist. He went out into the world, spoke the gospel to the masses, and did what an evangelist should do, connected people with the local church. That's how it works. So there is a gift of evangelism. The church needs that gift. It's important, and it is existing today. Then we have the gift of pastors. Um, the word translated to pastor means herdsman. All right? Someone who herds animals, a shepherd. Um, we all know that Jesus is the head of the church, right? But each church has a shepherd as given. Jesus modeled that. He showed what it looked like. Uh, he said he was the good shepherd. He didn't push anybody. He pulled people. He drew people. He gathered people. And that's what he's gifted pastors to do. Um, he called us to meet the day-to-day -day needs of the congregation. Uh, we do that through counseling, comforting, um, confronting sometimes, uh, and guiding we do that here from the pulpit, the, the pastor and the preaching ministry, excuse me. And we also do it in the office uh, or at the coffee house or wherever we are. That's what we're called to do, called the day-to-day -day shepherding of the flock of God. 
Now, I've got to pause here today because many churches and individuals have messed this up, and you've probably experienced this, and so I want to share it. There are two ends of the spectrum here. Some have confused the gift of pastoring with the gift of preaching and teaching. All right, And, and two faults have come from that. First, some churches have hired what they thought was a pastor when it was a teacher or, or preacher. There is a difference. Okay? A teacher or preacher can share the word of God. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but not shepherd the flock of God. And so some churches have inaccurately hired a teacher or preacher who's not a pastor who cannot lead the flock, and they've suffered because the group cannot be led. That happens a lot. Then there's the other end of the spectrum. There is the mafia church. I call them. They got church mafia, right? The deacons sit in the big high chairs and they fold their arms like this and they frown at people and they guard the back doors and if you don't put the money in the offering plate, they pass it again. Um, You got the church mafia, okay? You laugh, but you've seen it. I've seen it. And churches like that, they say they're looking for a pastor, but they're not really. They're just looking for a teacher and a preacher because they want to run the church themselves. They don't want to be led. They don't want to be shepherd because they're in charge. And so they wind up hiring pastors who aren't allowed to pastor. Because of it, they wind up cycling through pastor after pastor, never figuring out why the church isn't going anywhere. It's because they're not being shepherded. You see the differences. There are two. The pastor is the shepherd and must lead the flock. That's a gifting that God gives to the church, or Jesus specifically gives to the church. Now, let's discuss the last gift he listed, and that is teachers. Okay, Um, The two Greek words, pastor and teacher, are actually connected. And if you notice, the NLT does a good job with the translation. It says, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers. So it does go together. That means the pastor should be also a gifted teacher. Now, all of us are enabled by the Holy Spirit. It's one of his jobs to help us understand the Word of God. So each person in this room that's a Christian should be able to open up the Bible, read the Bible, understand it, and be able to apply it to your life. That's, that's what's given to you by the Holy Spirit. But there's a difference in that and being able to teach it, right? There's a difference in knowing a topic and being able to explain it to other people. That's the difference of the gift of teaching. The teacher that's gifted by God can read it, understand it, and put it in a way that others get it. That's the gift of teaching. Every pastor should have it. It should be a requirement. But not every teacher is a pastor. And I just explained that a minute ago. So that's the gift of teaching that he's given to the church. And we'll understand that here just a little bit more. Now, we come to the big finish. Why did Jesus go to these efforts? Why did he descend? Why did he ascend? Why did he give gifts? The purpose of the gift is this way. Their responsibility, the gift of leadership, is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. That's the reason that Jesus gave the gifts to the church. That's something that's been neglected in in the church, I know, in America for many years. The pastor's not called to do all the work of the ministry. There are churches where that's belief. The pastor's not called to do all the confrontation. He isn't the one who is to run out and um, sick. <laughs> I like this. Well, my brother Joe is unsafe. Pastor, you need to go talk to him. Or, well, my husband won't come to church. Pastor, you need to go talk to him. Uh-uh, that's not what the Bible says, is it? The Bible says that we're supposed to be able to give an answer for the hope that we have. We're supposed to share our testimony and be the witnesses who do that. Um, He's not the one that you sick on those who are saved and living in sin. Pastor, I raised my kid in church, and now he's out living in the world. You need to go talk to him. Or, Pastor, my husband, he he claims he's a Christian, but, boy, he's not living like one. You need to go. Absolutely not. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 say that's your job. Okay? Uh, I can run through all these. He's not the one who's supposed to fix all the conflicts in the church. Well, pastor, them two ladies, they ain't got along for years. Man, they're causing all kinds of trouble. You need to go fix that. Uh Uh-uh. Matthew 18, 15 says it's not my job either. It's yours. Stop and think about the way this is supposed to work. Far too long, churches have worn out pastors with unbiblical expectations. Okay? Unbiblical expectations. And for far too long, pastors have neglected their family and their own health, mentally, spiritually, and physically trying to meet those expectations. Let me give you an example. Okay? Pastor's kids, right, are polar opposites typically. They're either the worst kids in school or they're the best kids in school, right? It's very rarely in the middle. Usually they're one or the other. And if they're the worst kids in school, he catches flack for it, right? 
It makes the church look bad. It makes the pastor look bad, and justifiably so. All right, he has failed in some areas. But in many of those cases, the church should probably look in the mirror and say, huh, maybe he's been wiping too many snotty noses and changing too many dirty diapers in the church and not been able to raise his own kids. Hmm. Happens. Seen it. Understand it. Okay? These gifts are given to the church, not so that the church can sit back and let the staff do all the work. These gifts are given to the church so that the church can do the work as they're taught by the pastors and the staff. Okay? What is the goal? The goal is maturity. The goal is maturity. You come to church for a lot of reasons, but the best reason you should come to church is so that you can mature. He says very clearly, what is the goal? That you can live up to the standard of Christ. You're not going to be perfect by any means until you die. But every Christian should have this goal that I want to be better today than I was yesterday. I want to be more like Jesus today more than I was yesterday. That's our goal. And that's why the gifts are given to the church. And that's why we're here. It's to mature, not be the children that we were when we were saved, but we grow up in our faith and mature. And he says, why is that important? Uh, uh, Yeah, okay, I'll take some risks. Why is it important that you mature and you mature in your faith and mature in your word? As Paul said, he warned, there are going to be people out there that try to trick you. There are going to be people out there that try to lead you astray. There are going to be people out there who use the Bible and try to confuse you to follow their way. And if you're not mature, you're going to fall into it. How do denominations, I'm just going to say it, how do denominations come to the point they accept gay marriage today? How in the world does that happen? It happens just like this. It happens because the church has not matured. The people have not matured. They have not read God's word. They do not study God's word and understand God's word to the point they say, wait a minute, that's not okay. And we're not supposed to endorse that. Okay? And and that's how it happens. It happens when the church does not mature. And that happens because they're not utilizing the gifts that God has given. That's just one good example of immaturity and where it can lead in the church. It's done a lot of damage. Our goal should be to mature, to be more like Christ, to know his word better every day. And that's what the church is all about and what it's for. Obviously, the ultimate goal is unity. We covered this last week, so I don't need to talk about it in detail. The unified church is the greatest example of the gospel in the world that could be. It's what attracts the world when a group of diverse people with all of our differences can come together under one roof with one purpose, serving one Lord in one body. And that's like a wow factor. Look at those people. I want to be a part of that. And that happens when we utilize these gifts. Okay? Now, let's close by going back, um, going back to my bluefish example. Okay? Um, I got a nickname. Some of you may know it. Some of you don't. It's on my bowling ball. What's, what does it say? Anybody see it? Hatch. My nickname is Hatch. Okay, so you learned something today if you didn't know that. I earned that nickname. Okay? Um, when you get to the submarine... Obviously, you don't want water on the people side of the submarine, right? The water has to stay on the non-people side. That's how it works. Um, And so when you're a new officer on board, what you have to do is you learn to set up the ship so that you can submerse it and water doesn't come in. That's your job. You oversee that. And it's a football field long, the submarine. I was on 300 feet long. And so you've got to imagine there's valves and there's hatches, things you've got to do. And so you've got to go sure, make sure everything's ready before the submarine goes under the water. Well, that was one of my first jobs that I had to do. And so I was doing it, and there are hatches. There's two hatches aft, and there's two hatches forward. One on the outside, one on the inside, right? Double protection, outside, inside. And so part of the deal is to go through and get inside those and move all the valves, make sure everything's set up, and then shut the hatch and move on. Well, I left one open. Assuming someone was going to come behind me, because I was new at this, I assumed someone would come behind me and close it, because that would just be obvious. And so I did. I left it open, and I went on and did my job. Well, we, we submerged the, the submarine, and somebody catches that, and everything goes nuts. It was like 4th of July. There were alarms going off. There were craziness going off. We had to emergency surface that submarine, get up on top, uh, because if, if it had failed, we would have all died. Right? And it would have been my fault. I got in big, big, big trouble. That's where I got my nickname. Okay? Big trouble. And so we had to submerge or surface, and I had to go from the back end of that submarine to the front end and touch every single valve in that boat and line it up. And I shut the hatches this time. Everybody had to wait on it. It held up the mission. 
it, it caused a lot of problems because I assumed someone was going to come behind me and do the work I was supposed to do. Can't do that in the church. A lot of it, ha- you know, people assume somebody just go come behind me and do that work. You're called, right? You're gifted. You need to live a life that's worthy of that calling. That means you need to use that gift in the church. And so maybe that's your invitation today. Don't leave the hatch open. Make sure you're doing what God has called you to do, not just in the community, but in the church as well. Use it in the church, okay? The second invitation may be, are you appreciating the gifts in the church? I'm not saying pat me or Mark or Andrew or Meredith on the back. I'm saying, are you appreciating the gifts? Are you sitting under the teaching? Are you maturing in your faith? Are you growing in unity as a church? If not, today's the day to repent. Right? This is where God puts his gifted evangelists, teachers, pastors. This is where you need to be. You need to be faithful to it so that you can grow and mature and be more like Christ. If you're not, today's the day to repent of that. Obviously, if you're not a Christian, you heard the greatest news of all. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, came to suffer, came to die because we couldn't do it ourselves. He died for our sins on the cross Three days later, he was resurrected, raised from the dead to show us, hey, the grave doesn't win. And he said, if you believe in me, you will live even after dying. That's the greatest news of all. If God's drawing you, you know it. If he's putting a burden on your heart for salvation, today is the day. Come forward during our last song. Tell one of us, hey, I want to be saved. God's calling me. We'd love to talk to you about that. All right, God, thank you for what you've done today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your challenge. Thank you for the gifts that you give to the church. And thank you for the fact that every believer sitting in a seat this morning has been given the ability to do at least one thing well for your kingdom. I pray that they'll be searching their hearts today. And God, I pray that they'll understand that that gift's to be used in the church. And I thank you for all those who are already doing this. And that's why the church is succeeding today. So Father, I pray that you'll burden our hearts uh, with growing in our maturity and our unity. Thank you for the instruction that you've given us today. Most importantly, thank you for the good news that we've shared. And I pray that if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that's not a Christian, I just pray that the burden on their heart will be so heavy this morning that they can't do anything else but to get up and come forward and say, I want to follow Jesus Christ. God, the angels in heaven rejoice when that happens, and we're going to rejoice with them too. So I pray for that end this morning. God, I love you, and I thank you. Bless your invitation in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is your time to respond.